Aline Elif Erdin is an architect and researcher. Currently, she teaches at the Architectural Association AA School of Architecture, Immersion Technologies and Design Graduate Program. She is the program director of AA D Lab Visiting School and AA Istanbul Visiting School. She worked for Zaha Hadid's Architects during 2006-2010. She received her B.Arch degree from Istanbul Technical University in 2003, high honors, and M.Arch degree from the AA Design Research Lab in 2006. Her research interests are the integration of algorithm generative design with large-scale digital fabrication tools and in physical uh, computing. Ms. Elif Erdin, the floor is now yours. Hi, good morning, everyone. Very, to, very happy to be here. Um, thank you again for inviting me uh, for a sketch, and I am going to share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, we can. Great. Yes, we can. Perfect. So thanks, thanks again for the invitation. I'm very happy to, to be here with you all. Um, and so <clears throat> I will be um, talking about the postgraduate program at the AA, Emergent Technologies and Design, um, and within the theme of ESCAD, uh, how it, it, how we make use of kind of hybrid workflows and hybrid technologies uh, across scales and across different mediums, basically. Um, and so what we mean by emergent technologies, it's really about addressing emerging problems that are existing in the world and how we address those problems and how we try to come up with solutions that integrate both traditional technologies as well as um, innovation and new technologies and techniques in the world. <clears throat> and so, um, I thought that uh, today I would talk about the kind of multifaceted nature of the architectural profession in general. And in my opinion, as architects, we're trying to resolve issues that you know ultimately end in the production of space. Um, obviously, because architecture is a multifaceted field, and the answer to these questions of space production can be of completely different types and, 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 and various natures. So for example, obviously, the first solution that comes to mind is architectural solutions. Um, these answers can also be at the ecological scale, which we deal with a lot in MTEC. Uh, urban solutions, material systems, they can be design processes, design methodologies, computational workflows, and they can even be software or applications. And so in MTEC, all has been and all is about experimentation, all is process. Uh, for the past 20 years or so, we've been experimenting with novel computational methodologies, building systems, and all of our computational experiments and systems are calibrated from physical experimentation. Uh, so this is really what I want to talk about today, like how all of our physical experiments lead us to devise computational, uh, let's say, workflows, and that's what creates the hybrid nature of our workflows in MTEC. Uh, so it's really about understanding material behavior on a component or re and regional scale, quantifying them to later on develop more complex uh design processes and computational workflows and so <clears throat> we believe that it is impossible to build on your knowledge from one project and so we try not to use more than one technique in one project and we approach research as a craft uh introducing material constraints and and really working within the craftsman tradition and the atelier tradition 
And obviously, all of these generally can be divided, let's say, into, into three big categories, digital, physical, and hybrid. And, and I must say that, you know, these may seem separate, but in the framework of architecture and how we approach design, actually are very much integrated together. And we approach them uh, as, as a kind of a unified, let's say, discourse. But for the sake of the presentation, I just wanted to kind of divide them into these three different realms. So I'll start with the, with the digital and um, at the end of the day, I, I just want to emphasize that, you know, um, there's a lot of importance, obviously, in the digital and the physical and how they come together to, to, to kind of formulate the hybrid. And so I guess you've heard this uh, phrase before, form follows nature, right? So, but what we, we are really talking about here is not imitating the forms of nature because this has already been done before. We are really interested in, in, in um, form following nature's processes and what we can learn from these processes in nature and how we can extract them and uh, apply them for architectural and technological solutions. And what we are really talking about here is the evolutionary process in nature, the evolutionary principles. So, <clears throat> as I said, evolutionary principles, processes learned from, from nature and how we can apply these processes uh, to computation. So if we consider, uh, let's say, three different fields as, let's say, evolutionary principles or uh, biological principles, computation and design, which are actually quite integrated, we can create a bridge between evolutionary principles and design through computational design. So that's how we kind of um, utilize computational design in our, in our workflows, in our computational and design workflows. And this, this bridge will ultimately create a feedback where you know, design and computation influence one another through what we learn from nature what we learn from biological principles. So biomimicry is one of the kind of principles that uh, kind of guide us and that kind of lead us in our design research processes, uh, which means basically the analysis of natural systems and extraction of principles for technological applications. And by looking at nature, we develop algorithms, uh, let's say in this case, from the social behavior of insects, how local interactions lead to more complex behavior and how we can apply these models as growth models in architecture. So, you know, there are very good kind of mathematical and computational models of these that are well, well documented in architecture and uh, computer science, such as uh, Stigmergy, such as cellular automata, so, as I said, we, we um, study morphological precedents from nature. We understand their structures, their performance, their behavior, and then we really investigate how to apply the principles that we learn from nature into the architectural and technological problems that we're facing. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're not interested in, let's say, bio-inspiration, but biomimicry. So really applying principles from nature uh, for architectural solutions. We also use new technologies that are being developed, such as AR, VR, XR, um, in, the, in the realms of Unity and AR for participatory design purposes. We're very much interested in inclusive design strategies and how to use, let's say, gaming engines to, to facilitate participatory design processes. In this case, you're looking at a design problem uh, which was contextualized in, in the Hudson area of London. Uh, how to, um, in this case, it was about how to kind of revive the public uh, spaces in, in London through participatory design. 
And we are also interested in using these new technologies as I, and again, in the, this is taking place in the realm of unity for narrative purposes. So <clears throat> how our students can um, come up with narrative processes to, to explain their projects, basically. Um, not just you know about the the final product but really talking about the entire process of design you know how they came up with the with the concept and then started developing their ideas and started testing material behavior at the same time uh de describing the kind of overall scale so on and so forth <clears throat> so what I'm trying to really kind of describe in, 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 in today's uh, presentation is the multifaceted nature of architecture, right? So architecture, ar architectural problems uh, contain multiple scales. And the majority of the problems that we deal with uh, in architecture have, have multiple different objectives. And that's why evolutionary computation and in general, learning from nature is quite relevant because obviously nature teaches us about the kind of complex nature of systems uh, that emerge from the local interaction of different parts. So that really <clears throat> brings us to, to, to kind of question the role of the architects. Um, this kind of way of enabling computation um, really necessitates us to think about the role of the architect. And um, I believe that when, when architects use uh, these kinds of, let's say, computational tools and complex ways of problem solving, our role will change from coming up with a single solution to coming up with a question or a series of questions. So rather than designing a single solution, it's really about designing the problem. And that is really what we learn from nature and complex systems in nature. And that brings me to the question or to the, uh, let's say, um, principles of, of genetics and evolutionary computation. So it's really about, you know, uh, understanding graphing functions, multiple conflicting criteria. And through this process of, of running genetic algorithms, we can run obviously many generations and keep track of every single individual that is, that is being created. And uh, it really necessitates us to think about the design problem, as I said, rather than thinking about a single solution and really about understanding and evaluating the, design, the, the, the results and apply them for our design solutions later. <clears throat> and these, these these techniques are in a way scalable. So you know we can we can um, come up with multiple design problems that are emerging in different parts of the world um, across different scales. So they can be either the material scale, as I said, urban scale, ecological scale, <clears throat> and uh, really apply the kind of complex patterns and. Uh, issues that are emerging in these different biomes and apply them for, for complex design problems. And moving on, uh, how do we adopt these technologies when it comes to the actual building scale? Uh, how do we employ these skills? So I will, I will talk a little bit about the kind of physical, let's say, nature of things. And again, how the physical problems um, allow us to create, again, hybrid solutions across different scales. And so in MTEC, uh, um, we've been working very much um, with timber for the past two decades or so, and we've been very much interested in advanced fabrication techniques with timber uh, and physical computing. And I must say that in general, there is this culture of making at the AA and the joy of making and basically learning by experimentation, learning by doing. And you know, each of these projects have obviously different functions uh, and different kind of fabrication and making processes. And as I touched on in the beginning of the presentation, we, we like to kind of focus on one technique in each project. 
and learn from that. Um, and some of these the, the these uh, structures that you see have been created in collaboration with different institutes, such as this one uh, that was created uh, in collaboration with ETH. And so, you know, we we really in, we we can call these as as perms, and why do we call them performative? Because obviously. Uh, at the very least, uh, their self-standing structures, they need to uh, react to various types of forces and loading conditions, right? Uh, such as self-weight or wind behavior. This is another example uh, from our collaboration with Arab. And they, they really all start with, uh, let's say some, tabletop explorations uh, by our students. And then, you know, it's kind of iterative nature of of uh, experimentation a large scale we also have a very kind of interdisciplinary project on a structural scale and just to kind of delve into um kind of hybrid nature of our uh, let's say interdisciplinary processes and our design workflows i will talk about our recent collaboration with hessel studio that took place last year um and our structural consultants were Bureau Heppel Engineering, and our life cycle assessment sponsor was One Click LCA. And uh, this pavilion called the Reemerge was uh, located on Bedford Square, in front of the AA, and it was open to visitors uh, for a month. So this is Bedford Square where the AA is located, and I will not delve too much into the uh, physical, let's say process uh, or the physical experimentation, but I would really, I really want to kind of emphasize how those physical processes or experimentation um, informed our uh, computational processes, what we learned from the physical experiments. So um, <clears throat> basically, uh, based on the principles of sustainability, Hessel Studio asked us to, to keep the carbon footprint of this project uh, to an absolute minimum. And therefore we were asked to, to use only reclaimed wood. Um, and of course, using reclaimed wood means that um, the system needs to be modular. And we also started to examine the life cycle assessment methods to measure the carbon footprint. Um, and actually we had not worked with, you know, uh, life cycle assessment processes before. So it was quite interesting for us. So <clears throat> the, the fact that the system need to, needed to be modular has obviously a couple of advantages. Uh, the, the efficiency of the system increases because we're working with similar, or let's say the same design elements, in this case, timber beams. Um, so it, it allows for streamed uh, line fabrication, streamlined assembly and assembly processes and facilitating the addition or subtraction of these timber elements from the system. And as I said, the main uh, idea was minimizing carbon footprint and analyzing the ecological impact. And uh, through our research, what we found out was that um, construction waste, and in this case, uh, timber planks, can be a very useful resource. And they kind of led this research to redesign timber for a lightweight outdoor structure and to highlight the ecological impact of the project from the early stages of the design. So we're looking at uh, some of the earliest, let's say, timber uh, planks that we found. We got in contact with recycling facilities in and around London. <clears throat> so these are the kind of like, this is the kind of average length width and, 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 and timber that we could find. And because we were interested in creating a lightweight structure using these uh, timber beams, 
rather than let's say stacking them vertically or horizontally, um, we started thinking about curve banding and steam banding of timber elements. And again, uh, relating to the ecological impact, we wanted to reduce the secondary material. So we were looking into uh, cross slab joints and how to kind of, as, as I said, decrease uh, secondary joiner elements. So at the end, uh, we came up with this kind of system of design uh, where uh, we could curve band and steam band these timber beams into these kind of uh, curved timber, let's say, elements, which would, con which, which would then constitute these, what we call the ribs that were attached to each other. And through the rotation of these ribs, we could come up with a structural system, basically a load bearing system. And this is also uh, this also became uh, our uh, let's say design proposal for Pelin Architecture Biennale, and we were finalists in that competition as well. At the same time, so these are just some process images. As I said, I will not talk too much about the uh, physical process but uh, you're seeing some kind of early prototypes of our um, curving and seam banding. And, you know, our students created a lot of experiments um, using these principles of curve banding and seam banding and how much curvature we could induce in these timber elements, basically and where they fail and how they fail and uh, you know what are the kind of extremes that we need to take into account. And at the same time, um, as I said earlier, we started looking into the life cycle assessment processes uh, of using timber. So, um, and how we could use life cycle assessment LCA as a design driver in our computational workflows. And that really allowed us to consider not not only the material itself, as in timber, but also the carbon emissions associated with its origins and transportation to Bedford Square. So it really emphasized a kind of comprehensive information for, for the preliminary design phase. And uh, analysis of most types of plywood used for exterior construction versus solid wood planks uh, actually shows that plywood's carbon emissions are significantly higher uh, in preparation than solid wood planks. And at the same time, the same effect occurs when newly produced solid wood and reclaimed wood are compared. So uh, we established, let's say, the principle that through the use of these reclaimed wood panels, we could um, reduce the carbon footprint. And uh, at the same time, simultaneously, we were obviously analyzing the structure for its uh, structural, let's say, performance. And in this process, you know, through our understanding of the material behavior, the life cycle assessment process and structural performance, we integrated everything that we learned, as I said, material information, structural performance, carbon footprint into a kind of uh, um, streamlined computational workflow using the Wallace C platform. So Wallace is an evolutionary uh, engine for Grasshopper that has been developed by PhD researchers in MTech. And <clears throat> in this kind of collaboration, let's say, uh, between architecture and, and computation through this evolutionary algorithm method, uh, obviously, there are, let's say, three important steps. One is the design problem, that's the first step, then there is the evolutionary algorithm, and then there is the kind of selected solutions and how we analyze and evaluate those selected solutions to come up with, with let's say, a candidate to, to, to move forward, right? And so bookends are really the first and the last steps. And uh, these are the important parts or the important processes for the architect um to to kind of think about and to come up with uh, we know what the computer is capable of obviously and that's taking kind of care of the evolutionary process but as architects we need to ask the right questions uh 
uh, to come up with the, let's say, as I say, the design problem itself, that's the first step. And also to be able to analyze and evaluate the design solution space in the last step. So <clears throat> all of the kind of material, let's say, uh, experiments that um, our, our students came up with were translated, let's say, into a series of lines of codes uh, for the computer uh, to, to kind of understand what is happening. Again, going back to the computer acting as a bridge between, uh, let's say, design and natural processes, understanding nature's processes, in this case, understanding and translating material behavior. And the second step was to create a morphology. Uh, Sorry, one second. To create a morphology from you know all these ribs and to kind of search the solution space um, by kind of looking into three fitness objectives. One was minimizing the height to weight, height height to width ratio. The second objective was minimizing the carbon footprint, as I said through LCA. And the third objective was minimizing the displacement values through finite element analysis. So in this case, you're looking at, you know, a solution space of, let's say, several hundred candidates. And obviously everything is numerical. So everything, you know, we kind of understand performance through looking at these kind of graph functions and understanding really what they mean and how those different morphologies that you saw perform. And that kind of led us to come up with a design solution that uh, we could construct within a certain time frame. And obviously documentation is also very important in this case and how that kind of feeds back all the kind of information about, uh, about documentation feeds back into our computational processes. And what was also very kind of important for us in this, in this uh, case was, um, was that our students came up with a special application, a special app for visitors uh, of the pavilion. It's, it's an AR app and it allows users to learn about the let's say the history of the pavilion, where these timber plants came from, uh, kind of their story, um, the life cycle assessment of the pavilion, its design and manufacturing processes, as well as, as well as various kind of visualization options. And I just want to take you to an important step in this uh, process, where we, um, actually projected the pavilion itself in, in, in real time in a one-to-one -one scale. And that really helped us with the construction process, basically. So how to start the construction or the assembly process, that was quite helpful uh, in, in using, through using this uh, AR app. So these are some um, just say time lapse videos of the construction process itself. It took around five days. Just jump to the final parts of it. Just some final images taken by studio uh, by Studio Naro. And I, I, I just want to highlight uh, this actually, um, this kind of final stage where, where we captured the pavilion itself through Metaport technology in order to create a point cloud. And the reason why we think this is quite important is that we could then overlay the final, let's say, um, physical pavilion 
with the with the computational design and we could compare the deflections as you can see and why this is important is it's, it's really because we can really learn from this process you know by using these kind of computational techniques we can learn you know where uh, where the pavilion failed uh how it failed as you can see there's a some kind of deflection in the overhang area and how this could be improved and you know this is this is uh, what we think the strength of computational processes lies, right? So we can then uh, understand from what worked and what failed, and we can reflect on that and we can improve on that in later iterations of our design workflows. And uh, we won the Architides for A plus awards in the architecture and collaboration category with Hessel Studio, which is obviously um, uh, a kind of a good outcome of this of this collaboration because we really believe that there needs to be more collaboration between academia and practice to kind of improve our computational uh, workflows and 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 really to learn from each other. And that really takes me to the final part of my presentation. Um, as I said, I started with the digital, moved on to the physical, and moving on to the hybrid. And obviously, as I said, um, actually in the framework of architecture, these are very much integrated with each other. <clears throat> and I really want to kind of emphasize the importance of both uh, aspects, digital and physical, uh, in this kind of hybrid realm in, in, in solving uh, architectural problems. So going back to the initial part of my presentation, emergent technologies is really about, um, we're very much interested in solving emergent, uh, emerging problems that are existing in the world. And these problems uh, take place across scales. So it's really about emphasizing a multi-scalar design process and coming up with novel architectural solutions to existing design problems. And so I'm going to show very briefly a kind of snippets, examples from uh, our students' dissertations, thesis uh, processes. Um, so these solutions might be related in this case to food production capacity in cities, through hydroponics, kinetic secondary facade systems that are designed and uh, where architectural properties are added and integrated with the architectural solution in order to reduce energy consumption uh, by adapting into changing external conditions. In this case, we're looking into plastic recycling in Almeria, Spain, it's really about creating a rapid lightweight assembly that is climatically responsive uh, and hydro and thermally integrated um, farming system to sustain food production in arid conditions. And how that system can also enable a productive settlement for workers. In this case, you're looking into the context of India, mycelium growth more specifically, relationships between material resonance, earthquake resistance structures and fabrication processes. So how to enable mycelium in order to create a, an earthquake resistant architectural system, which then is configured into in a larger scale into kind of an urban settlement system. Uh, robotic nomadism, a material system which can provide dwellings for nomadic pastoralists in sub-Saharan Africa using existing construction techniques and additive manufacturing. So again, um, studying vernacular precedents such as actively banned armature tents and earthen construction techniques and applying these uh, and integrating these, let's say, well-documented systems for novel robotic proce processes. In this case, adaptive floating settlements, integrating different strategies and design processes to address wave energy reduction and develop organizational logics of floating settlements. So a again, understanding the context 
uh, in every case. So in this case, the research was contextualized uh, in, a, in a settlement in China. In this case, uh, this research was conducted in, in strategizing, let's say, the use of ecological uh, sand stabilization techniques to form wind deflection strategies. And this one that you're looking at uh, was focused on a coastal region, Indonesia, where the research ambition was to generate ecologically resilient multifunction offshore, offshore structures for urban living. Uh, through the study of coral grafting um, as a sheltered habitat for reef fish. And finally, the uh, looking into the urban development of a high density settlement, uh, in, in this case, Tokyo Bay facing fluvial and fluvial flooding is addressed and the resilient design approach is, investigating, is investigated through the generation analysis and evaluation of an integrated hydrological system from base scale to the local scale and really studying water dissipation strategies through offshore breakwaters, channel strategies in order to develop a modified water network that can then be integrated with the urban, uh, let's say settlement system. Um, these emerging problems can also be of social, uh, let's say scale in this case, the problem of urban spaces and communication of people in urban space uh, and in, in, in this specific example, the thesis uh, had a critical look at the way of using an urban space in London and trying to produce a material system and a mobile application AR app that pe people can use to create a positive and constructive interaction between themselves in urban space. So exploitation of cyber physical systems in public spaces as a means of in, in, increasing social mixing and social interaction and it was very much focused on the notion of an anticipatory cycle and a data-driven structure, uh, looking at inclusive strategies, quantifying them in algorithmic manner to facilitate their uh, in, uh, implementation. And the architectural application was about the was was about an actuated origami uh, structure that are explored in conjunction with a pneumatic mechanism for their actuation. And the final example that I would like to talk about um, addresses the lack of housing, uh, basically. And this thesis uh, aimed at presenting an automated system uh, to create a collaborative design and construction network to solve, as I said, uh, the problem of lack of housing in Singapore. Um, obviously, there's an increased demands for buildings that change over time, uh, let's say to adapt to newly emerging needs for different qualities and quantities of architectural information. And so this research really aimed at demonstrating a design workflow that can respond to dynamically changing environments over time with a bottom-up approach of design. Um, a residential neighborhood in Singapore that can be reconfigured based on personal requirements of the users, and that can possess sustainable construction and material systems through timber that allow it to adapt to changes over time by altering the spatial configurations based on future requirements. And the, the methods that were investigated were advanced procedural design and artificial intelligence techniques. So we're looking at the kind of evolution of these spaces throughout years, uh, you know, in relation to the changing needs uh, of the population in that specific context. <clears throat> and so, the way I kind of want would like to uh, finalize is 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 that you know all of this obviously research it's very important for us that this is you're looking at an image from our bookshelves in Imtech. Uh, all of this research is is documented into these books. 
uh, that are then you know shared uh, with academia and practice through different media, through different publications across books, uh, as well as journal publications, conference publications as well. And um, we're a, a team of um, architects, as well as engineers, as well as theoreticians, AR, XR developers. So it's very much interdisciplinary. And, and we very much value that interdisciplinary kind of nature of, of the program, as well as the students. Our students also come from different backgrounds. Uh, they're not just coming from architecture, but let's say structural engineering, um, different type kind of um, uh, um, streams of engineering, product design, so on and so forth. And so, um, I guess you're familiar with this phrase, each generation must build its own city. This was posited by the futurists around a hundred years ago. So what we try to do through these kind of hybrid processes of you know, making and computation and their kind of communication within each other is that how are we going to build our cities of the future? And I will leave it with that question. Um, and thank you very much. <laughs>